Hey guys, welcome. It's Friday. Today, we're going to have another conversation with one of our Sweet Georgia ambassadors. Today, we're speaking with Debbie Held. She is a spinner. She's a writer from Atlanta and Georgia. And today, we are going to have a conversation about spinning and how spinning is such a huge part of her morning ritual and part of her daily life. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Felicia from Sweet Georgia, and this is Taking Back Friday. This is a space where we come every Friday and we talk about knitting and spinning and weaving and dyeing. Now, if you are interested in any of these fiber arts, I really encourage you to subscribe to our channel so that you can see when all the new videos are released. Usually we release new videos every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Now this year, as part of something new, we are having conversations with many of the multi-craftual makers in our our community and just hearing about how they perceive and how they work with different crafts in their lives, how they juggle between the different crafts that they work on. And today we are speaking with Debbie Held. So Debbie has been working with Sweet Georgia since about 2019 when we first launched the Ambassador Program. And I invited Debbie to be part of this Ambassador Group because she was such a, a wonderful spinner, but not only in her own skills and technique, but just in the way that she's able to really enable and encourage people to try spinning for the first time. And it's a kind of energy that I thought would bring a lot of positivity to spinning. And so we have worked for the past year or so on a number of different workshops for the School of Sweet Georgia. She taught um, how to work with supported spindles, also how to work with e-spinners. And she is now working on a course with us about how to work with blending boards. And then I hope that you will stay for after the conversation with Debbie because I have all these things that I want to show you that Debbie mailed to me and we can talk a little bit more about her workshop with the Rolex. So let's go to our call. Thank you so much for being here today, Debbie. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on this call with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Felicia. I appreciate it. I'll say it's actually, it's long time no see because actually <laughs> we were on Zoom together yesterday. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I think what people may or may not uh, know is that um, Debbie and I, we've been working together for probably more than a year now. Is that right? Probably more than a year now. I know that you joined Sweet Georgia as a brand ambassador, yep. not for this year, but for the previous year. Yep. But we have been working on many projects together since that time. So um, for those of you guys who may not know, Debbie is one of our instructors for the School of Sweet Georgia, and she has been teaching a number of spinning classes for us since, well, since the beginning of the pandemic. Originally, we had planned on having Debbie in Vancouver, and we were going to film together with Debbie and do all these things, but we have literally been working together for almost a year at a distance, yeah. um, basically over Zoom and trying to organize lots and lots of things, and uh, so very, very, very excited because yesterday we were again together on Zoom uh, shooting for a new workshop that's going to be coming out and it's going to be called, um, well, it's about blending boards, but it's going to be called Roving from Rovings to Rolex. From Rolex to Roving, I think, right? From Rolex <laughs> to Roving, go, going beyond the going beyond the Rolex, something like going beyond the Rolex. It's you, you can name it, you name it, but that's. <laughs> That so basically the idea is it is about blending boards. It's about blending fibers together to make Rolex, all different kinds of Rolex. And so that is fantastic. Um, in trying to figure out, you know, ways of working together over this pandemic, um, I watched Debbie make all of these beautiful, fluffy Rolex on screen. And I was like, can I have them? <laughs> And so then she mailed them to me. So um, I've been photographing them and they're beautiful. They're fluffy and they're sparkly and they're just so shiny and pretty. And so we're really excited to be able to share that with you guys soon. Um, but yeah, I wanted to chat more with Debbie today because you have so much, it's just such an extensive background in spinning. And I can see your beautiful wheel back there. I can see oh, yes. spinner. What wheel is that? It's beautiful. That is a CPW. It's a Frankenstein um, Canadian production wheel back there. And I got it for a very, very good deal. And that thing is fast. And I really just in my mind had always envisioned having one. So mm -hmm. I love it. A lot yeah. of fun. 
Yeah. It's like the, it's a fairy tale wheel style, right? That Saxony style. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. I had that vision in my head too, like sitting at a fairy tale wheel, sitting by the fireplace and then spinning right. long draw. And, right. Yeah. It's a very, you romantic have one. Feeling. You have I the, do. Yeah. 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 And I, it's, yeah. Yeah. I managed to get a Lendrum, a Lendrum Saxony wheel that somebody was letting go of. I was very, very lucky to be notified by somebody who knew that I was chasing after that for a long time. But yeah, these tools, they make our, our work so, so enjoyable. Can you talk oh, a little definitely. bit about like your, your favorite tool maybe? What, what's been your favorite tool recently? Because I know you spin mm. with a lot of different kinds of tools. Yeah, I think definitely it's, it's a mood, um, more of a phase even. Lately, I have been doing a lot of e-spinning to the point where our people have asked me, um, do you even use a regular wheel anymore? And of course I do. But lately, I have been doing a lot of e-spinning, um, just trying to figure out more nuances, more subtleties. That's really what I, what I love to do is use something and then figure out, I don't know, maybe figure something out from it or making it more effective or just, I think I'm pretty much your average spinner, your average maker. And I feel like if I'm interested in it, maybe other people are too. Mm -hmm. I know like um, very often we get caught up in this sort of race towards, or not even a race, but just kind of like the, the, the obsession with acquiring a little bit more gear, a little bit more gear. I know that every time you post a supported spindle photo on Instagram, or sometimes Diana Twist will post a supported spindle photo on Instagram. And I literally immediately <laughs> go to Etsy and start searching for supported spindles. And I know that I don't need them because I do have a few right, that I haven't right. spent nearly enough time with. And, um, so I think about all of these things too, because I've been recently doing a little bit more e-spinning. I've been sitting at my Saxony wheel a little bit more. And I feel like every time I sit down with all of these things, it's just, you just need more time spent with these things. There's yeah. just not enough time to just sit and get to know that piece of equipment even more deeply. Yeah, that's why I, I thought about answering the spindle when you asked me the question. But in, in all honesty, I've noticed a correlation between something, and that is the past couple of months, right at the end of the, uh, December and into now, and I, I'm sorry, I know this isn't a great thing to say during a pandemic, but um, I have been busier than I've ever been. And, you know, just when you think you can't be busier uh, and, and you're already happy with the busyness that you have. So I kind of got, well, I got really tired and I cut out the morning ritual of my spindling. And that, and I always, forever, that's been what I do. And I always, when people would say to me, you know, I don't have time to spin. And I would think to myself, yeah, I mean, I don't either, but we all make a few minutes. So I gave that, those few minutes up in favor of maybe working a few more minutes at the computer or, you know, getting a pitch in or whatever. And I have noticed my mood has not been as up as it, as it tends to be. So, I feel like it's unhealthy, you know, to not find these few minutes, but if you only have a few minutes, that is why I do love a spindle and you only need one. I mean, I, I don't, I really, I freely admit that the ones I have are because I like, I like the way it looks when I spin across all of them, or I like the way it looks when I group them with a certain fiber, or a certain color. I mean, that is a privileged thing to say. And even so, those are the only ones left from a two-year de-stash mm -hmm. and even I sometimes think oh I really would like to get another and then I think don't don't be like that yeah I know but you know I I, I do think like tools are not merely functional things for people like us who appreciate color, who appreciate fiber. Like you appreciate the texture of what the fiber feels like. Definitely. You appreciate like the change in color from one staple length to another. Like all of these things that you notice and you appreciate, of course you're gonna appreciate them in your tools too. Of yeah. course you're gonna appreciate like beautiful wood or colored wood or just all of those things. Right. Of course they matter, they matter for sure. 
They matter. It's, it's good to hear that. They do matter. But I also don't want to be the person who has a um, hundred spindles. Not that there's anything wrong with having your hundred spindles. If you're, if the reasoning is right, I'm not even going to get in. There's sometimes people collect. I've noticed that sometimes people collect things in any of our, any of our fiber arts, they're collected more than they're used. Mm -hmm. That is a judgment on my part. So as long as we can all have access somehow to these things and nobody is just hoarding them away, then have as many as you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like to think they're being used by somebody who loves to use them. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I mean there. <laughs> <laughs> so you Tom, know? have you gone back to doing your morning ritual then of spinning? Like, how do you do it? Do you have a certain place in the house? Do you have a certain tool that you always use? I keep my spindles out and I'm about to select my next, um, my next pick. And I remember I got my little box out. I have a box of, um, I keep them all organized amongst themselves. So I have Turkish spindles and I have, you know, um, supported spindles and I have suspended spindles, which Turkish spindles are, but I just like keeping them separated. And Yes, I've been thinking about my next spin, and I think it's going to be the blue, your new blue, um, on Targi, because I mm -hmm. like a Targi on a spindle. Yeah. So that is the most fun, is, is matching them up. I don't know why, but I just enjoy it. It's like, it's like shopping for shoes or clothes or lipsticks or whatever your thing is. I just get a lot of joy out of that. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's one thing that I really specifically wanted to ask you about today, sure. and that is because there's been... I think um, a lot of conversation around this idea of being intentional with your work. We talk a lot about that at the school. Yeah. For sure. Like we talk a lot about how important it is to be intentional about what you're doing, that you're not just doing random things. But I feel like this is a, <laughs> it's a different time right now where we're going mm -hmm. through a different time. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder how you have been sort of working through your creative process and what you choose to make and how intentional you are about the things that you make, because you know, making a lot of decisions about what we make right now is a little bit heavy. It's, it's more things it to is. add on to all the other things that we have to decide about. And uh, so I wonder a little bit about what your process is. Are you very intentional before you spin or do you just pick something up and something that strikes your fancy and just, oh, let's just do it. I was not very intentional when I started. Then when maybe a few years ago, um, I became far more intentional and really felt great about that, but you're exactly right. Um, I noticed that I've always, I'm going to be completely honest. I've always had trouble matching my stash to my wheels. I get a little overwhelmed. I overthink. I mean, if it's a, if it's a non-essential decision throughout my life, that is really a problem for me. So I start to overthink, oh, if I spin this on there, then Maybe I could have, which is ridiculous because I have a lot of stash. It doesn't need to be a decision. But with my spindles, that is just joy. It's always been joy. It's always been about whatever I pick up that really strikes me at that moment. It's usually a bat or something carded, something lots of layers, maybe some texture. Um, but on the wheels, I, uh, yeah, I do tend to really think about what they what it will be but yes the past few months even a good friend of mine we talk about spinning every day we we direct message each other and even she said well, i'm just spinning to spin and that's that's awesome because mm -hmm. sometimes that's just what we need to get through these days i feel like that there's a there's a real opportunity for learning there as well just because i know when I first started learning how to spin, it was very much like, I'm just going to spin to spin. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just going to see what happens. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen if I do this and let's just see. And uh, I think that even, even if you are an experienced spinner, being open to that idea, well, like, I don't know what's, what's going to happen if we do this. What happens if I spin this thick? What happens if I spin this thin? What happens if I do whatever kind of apply to it? Then it kind of gives you that opening for new discoveries almost, right? Completely, completely. That's why it doesn't need to be this whole thought. If I start getting kind of obsessive about this, I remind myself, you know, there's plenty more where that came from. And it is great to do a two ply and then the next time a three ply and then don't forget to practice your chain ply. 
because that is the opportunity to be comfortable with the things maybe we weren't comfortable with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now I'm wondering, what do you do with all this yarn that you've made? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I stash a lot of it. Actually, not lately. Um, I sell some of it through Etsy. Um, I sell some of it just when people see it. Uh, if I post it online, I mean, I'm pretty lucky that way. I hoard some of it to match it to specific projects, but that's another issue with me because by the time I get to the project, I might not feel like knitting that thing, but I really do love to weave with it. And this entire year, this whole year, the 2020 that just came into exactly this time again, um, the one thing I haven't been doing is weaving. So that is on my this list. I, I've, um, I mean, I've woven a couple times, but I love hand spun with weaving. So when I tell myself, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to knit with it. I'm going to sell it or I'm going to weave with it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes my mother gets a skein or two. That's what I do. Yeah, I think that that is a, that is a bit of a challenge right now, right? Like figuring out what to do with all this hand spun yarn. And I know that you can get to that point where you've felt like I've made this thing and I'm okay with not doing anything else with this. Right. So this skein of yarn can go to someone else. Someone else can knit it. Someone else can do something with it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Figuring out what to make with the things that you have spun is tricky. The the, the thing that you were talking about weaving, I did over Christmas, I wove a little bit of stuff with my hand spun. I put some of the hand spun in the warp and then I did a different scarf where I put it in the weft and it's the same colorway just to see how it turned out. but I kind of like this idea of setting up a loom with just a big long warp, just one mm-hmm. color, and mm-hmm. then just putting all your hands on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, yeah, that could be really a nice way to use your hand spun and see it. And... That uh, scarf I showed you yesterday, the orange, it's really bright orange and green and it's reform style. And I wove it on my Cricut loom. Um, yes, I remember I had all these, I was a much newer spinner a brand new weaver. And I have all these skeins of some just tidbits of my favorite colors, which at the time, and maybe still are, a lot of orange, a lot of green. It's a lot of bold, but um, I just love the sparkle, non-sparkle, really thin, lace weight, uh, fingering weight. And I just thought these are beautiful together. And I warped that thing up and I just sat there and I wove back and forth. It's still my favorite scarf. Mm. I had locks that I really didn't know what else to do with locks. So I had seen some woven and sewery style or freeform style and stuck them in my, in my weaving. And yeah, it was, it's, gosh, it does seem like the, the greatest thing that you can do with your hand spun and even a massive hand spun, even hand spun that's not all the same size. If you have a variable warp, those, you know, the variable yeah, the, the variable dent reads yeah, where you yes. can have like some set really close and some set a little bit yes. further apart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I've ruined some hand spun trying that very same thing without the variable dent. Mm. But live and learn. I mean, I'll still wear it, but you live and learn. And how else will you? I think we all have to remember it's not the end of the world if you have a big bucket full of hand spun. It's kind of inspiring in its way. Now, when you teach and when you, you know, meet new spinners or meet new knitters or anything like that, like how, um, sort of, how do you go about explaining to them this whole journey or like sort of bringing them through this whole journey of all the things that you can do with fiber? Um, I feel like it has to be like encouraged very, very gently, very slowly over time, the sort of opening windows and showing people, oh, there's also this other thing you can do. Oh, there's also this other thing you can do. I mean, when I started spinning, it was, I learned on a spindle Mm -hmm. because that's the least expensive thing that I could get my hands on. And then I knew I was hooked. So then I went to the wheel and then I went to a spinning conference. And that's when I was just, it was just like the doors were blown open and I saw spinning on supported spindles and I saw people spinning like cobweb lace yarn and I was just like blown away with all the things how do you um how do you teach and share about that without overwhelming people (laughs) I remember okay the same friend that I talked to that I dm with about spinning every day um 
she has been to many, many conferences and meetups and gatherings. And when I started teaching, she would always tell me, you can never have too many samples. That's what wins people over. And I, I started to listen and I make sure I have samples and I hope that the samples I show and letting them, one day we'll get back to this, touch the weaving or touch the knitting or see all of your socks that you, uh, that you spun up on different bases and knit up for the class, whatever that might be. Uh, combination spinning, that was a big one. Um, people didn't really understand it. I was out of the country, so people didn't really understand it, but they were all eager to learn it. And you just bring samples. And I sometimes write up notes and we'll direct them to um, other places they can go look. So I like, I do stick in categories because it can be overwhelming. It's a lot, mm -hmm. you know, there's, what can't you do if you're into materials and if you're in to textiles really, I mean, it's overwhelming still mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's a lot to think about. Oh, I think so too. I think so all the time. I think that, you know, if you only wanted to focus on supported spindling for the next 10 years, there would be plenty <laughs> of things to work on there for sure. Be. Oh, there would be. And I, it's hard, even as my own self, sometimes I look around and I'm inspired, inspired by many, many people, but even I get overwhelmed. I get overwhelmed by um, social media. There's a lot to look at and I guess I'm sensitive that way. So I do tend to get overwhelmed and I don't want to do that to other people, but I get extremely excited when I'm teaching. And I hope, I hope that that inspires people. I mean, I hope that people can see, oh, look, she can do this, she can do that, or she said that. And if they only catch a few things, perfect. Those are a few things maybe they'll try. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. So like in this new year, 2021, what is the thing that you feel like you are most excited about learning right now? What is capturing your time and attention, do you think? This next six months, I know I've told you this, um, these next six months are unlike any next six months I've had. Uh, I've been just the past few weeks been working on a book. I'm co-authoring a book. It, the idea was brought to me. It's somebody I have written about uh, and for spinoff. So you just never know what's going to happen in your life. He asked me if I would co-author this book. And I said, sure. And we spent three and a half months on a pitch. And it was picked up right after we sent it. And that was how I closed out 2020. So over these next six months, I'm excited about putting my all into this project with somebody I really respect. And I know we're both looking forward to when we can just, you know, let loose and tell everybody what it is. It's a challenge. And so I think my bigger challenge is to make sure that every day I still get time with my spinning. And what I'm noticing is that has to be with my spindles. Mm -hmm. They are kept right by my sofa. I can wake up early in the morning. Uh, I had stopped watching the news as many of us had. So, you know, I'm trying to watch the news a little bit or be more educated or watch classes. You know, those are always fun. Um, I'm excited about maintaining my own spinning habit. That's a you great know. goal to have for the year. <laughs> thank you. To develop and I hope to a spinning wait. habit. I yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. It's my favorite thing. I uh, just, I don't remember who I was talking about this. Oh, my friend. And that, it's a different person. And she said, well, Debbie, don't, because I'm always like, oh, another sweater, another hand spun sweater. What? And then she wove a blanket. I'm like, you know, ah, oh, I'm kind of envious. And she said, Debbie, I'm a knitter who spins. You're a spinner who knits. And it couldn't be more true. So she is always thinking about her knitting, whereas I'm always thinking about my spinning. And mm -hmm. I need to be happy with that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's a really great way of thinking about it. Because it's not just being a knitter and a spinner and a weaver and a dyer and all those things. It's all of the different ways that you can look at that and experience that and what your priorities are and where your focus is. That's a really cool way of thinking about it. Do you think of yourself as one? more than the others? Hmm. I think I'm like a 
weaver who yes. spins and dies. Yes. I think, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I want to be a weaver. I want to be the weaver like I know I could be. But I'm just going to have to be happy right now with warping. There's nothing wrong with the rigid head of loom. I mean, ask Liz Gibson. They're awesome. But they're, I, as you may know, I, well, you, Felicia, know, there are a couple of looms, floor looms that crammed into the front entry of my apartment. So <laughs> at the same friend said to me, it's lovely, Debbie, but really, <laughs> do you think you're going to have the time to use that? And I'm like, no, probably <laughs> not. But <laughs> it's a great fair question. Absolutely not. But it's here. I've always wanted it to be here and it'll get warped at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's good to be excited about other things. I don't know. I can totally <laughs> see. I could totally see you taking your hand spun and weaving it before the end of this year. That's what I definitely. Know. Well, there's some on my rigid head loom because that is quick, <laughs> but I, I want to stop saying you don't have time. I, this is the one, the thing I'm going to get done in soon. I'll say in February. I'll say in February. So yeah, that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about just continuing my path because yes, I'm a big believer in goals and absolutely those crazy things like writing a book were on the list. It's nothing what I thought I'd be writing about. It's spinning adjacent and weaving adjacent and knitting adjacent. It's great. It's awesome. I'm really excited. So <laughs> I'm excited about learning more things, but maintaining my who I am, mm -hmm. my daily spinning. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today, Beth, Debbie, and, and congratulations on your book. We'll be very excited Thanks. to hear when you're able to announce what the topic is Thanks. and what you're going to be writing about. And um, yeah, I think that uh, I can just really honestly encourage spinners and people who love fiber to follow your Instagram. Your um, Instagram is doodler01. Yes. <laughs> One day I might change it, but probably not. And <laughs> it's who I've always been. But if you search Debbie Held, that name is under there too. So mm -hmm. that's me over there on Instagram. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Talk I can't to wait soon. to share with people what we have been working on. Oh, uh, that blending board. I love that thing. Did I just ruin it? No. Yeah, we were talking about <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> My favorite. It's, I love that thing. Love that thing. And I, I just, it can do so many things. It, it can do so much. And I, I hope, I hope that people will watch it and, and say, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Cause that's the best. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks for having me. Talk okay. to you soon. Bye. Bye. So I hope that you really enjoyed the conversation that I had with Debbie there. It was just a very brief conversation. We've been having a lot of conversations lately. So sometimes it feels weird to feel like we're talking for the first time because we've just been working together so much. But I thought it was actually really interesting how um, I feel like in the middle of our conversation, I came to the realization of how I approach this idea of multi-craftual making, that sometimes I refer to myself as a knitter, spinner, weaver, dyer, and I just treat all those things as equal and completely the same, but in fact, they are maybe not. Maybe you are a spinner who knits, or maybe you are a knitter who happens to spin, or like me, I think I just self-identified by accident that I feel like I'm a weaver who happens to spin and die. And so the things that I make with my spinning and with my dying, I have every intention of eventually weaving with them, or I, that's how I envision things happening. And so it was a very enlightening moment for myself just to have this conversation with Debbie, just such, such a short, simple thing, but just to realize that maybe that's how I perceive things. And so maybe the way that I spin or the way that I choose to dye yarn or dye fiber is different from somebody else who's wanting to use that for knitting or for crocheting, or just to have that thing at the end of the day, just the beautiful ball of hand spun yarn. So I wanted to show you some of the things that are in this bin here, these are the these are the things that Debbie mailed to me after we finished filming this uh, content for her blending board workshop, because the whole blending board workshop creation happened remotely, where basically Debbie and I were on a Zoom call together so that 
I could see, you know, what she was talking about, but at the same time, she had two cameras set up to film herself and her blending board, and then she sent us the footage and we are now editing it together. And I was watching her pull these, these Rolex off of the blending board and they were so fluffy and so beautiful. I just, I wanted to see them in person. And so she mailed me a giant box of the fluffiest Rolex ever. So I'm gonna show you a couple of them because they're just so pretty. But some of these, these are some of the things that have come off of the blending board that Debbie created with just very simple tools. One blending board, one dog flicker brush, and uh, just a bunch of random fiber that have been pulled together. You could use hand-painted fiber, hand-dyed fiber, solid fiber, you can use sparkles, you can use all sorts of little bits and pieces of fiber that you've been collecting. And then this can be spun off of the tip of each one of these roll legs, or you could do a bunch of different things with them. But they're so pretty, I just wanted to show you and see how light and fluffy they are. They're like pillows, they're like clouds, clouds of fiber, and they're so poofy. I can't hold them too hard, otherwise they, uh, I feel like I would squash them, but <laughs> they're just these airy tubes of fiber right now. And there's just a little hint of sparkle in many of them. And here's another set that have a little bit more gold sparkle in them. Obviously, you don't have to add sparkle if you don't like it, but, but that's kind of the stuff that we're working with and the kind of stuff that we're playing with. Every time I meet with Debbie to have one of these sessions to work on the blending board, uh, <laughs> I'm just so tempted to, to just get out the blending board and start working on these myself and just making a whole stash of Rolex. But I have lent out my blending board to Charlotte because she is also going to be making blending board content for the School of Sweet Georgia very shortly. So she's borrowing my blending board. The very first blending board that I bought, Tabitha ended up buying it from me. And so I have, I have bought a blending board three times and I've never had a chance to use it because it always just ends up going to someone else. And so I think I may have to either get the blending board back from Charlotte or just buy another one. <laughs> but these are just, it's been so tempting so many things to show you. And so I hope that if you are interested in working on making your own roll legs, using a blending board, learning different ways of using that tool, then I hope that you'll join us in the School of Sweet Georgia in a couple of weeks. And you can find uh, all the information that you need to about that upcoming course on the School of Sweet Georgia website, schoolofsweetgeorgia.com. And if you are a member, you'll obviously be notified when that content becomes live. So. That is basically it for today. I would love to hear from you, hear a comment about if you've ever used a blending board before, what your favorite thing is about blending boards. Tell me something about your interest in working with a blending board. I would love to hear about that. So thank you so much for being here. If you like this episode, please do hit the like button. And if you would like to see more content like this, please do hit subscribe. And we come here every Friday to talk about something to do with knitting or spinning or weaving or dyeing or color or fiber arts or something like that in general. Thanks so much for being here. I will see you in the next one. All right. Bye for now.